it's so much fun to worship with the kids. Thank you very much, adventurers. God bless you. Would you give them a hand? Thank you for blessing us this morning. Thank you for being a part of our worship service today and uh, for being just part of our family. Good morning, church. Uh, Brenda and I were gone this last week. Uh, we were back in Michigan, got to experience below zero temperatures and about 12, 14 inches of snow, which is fine if you're inside and you don't have to shovel driveways and things like that. But when you have to get out, it's frigid. Our, one of our kids has uh, chickens. And the chickens were fine. They didn't seem to mind. They just, you know, do what chickens do, I guess. But when they would lay an egg, it would freeze within the first few minutes. So the dog got some frozen popsicle chicken eggs. <laughs> you know, she seemed to enjoy them. Today we're talking about the second coming of Jesus. This is a topic that scares some people to death. This is a topic that excites some other people. But this is a topic that we have to recognize is a core, valid, anchor truth of Christianity. If there is no second coming, what are we doing? If Jesus is not returning to set things right and eliminate sin, hmm, the kind of the church thing is off the table. Have you ever played hide and seek? Raise your hand if you've played hide and seek. Even you non-voters can get involved in this. Okay? In my neighborhood, hide and seek was one of the highlight games of our community, our, our, the kids in our neighborhood. We lived on a T intersection, so we were in the middle of the T on Frobisher Drive. And Cortez came down and bumped into Frobisher, right there. And that was where hide-and-seek was best played. The telephone pole in front of our house was the counting post. And this, the neighbors in each of the yards on the corners and at our house were free game. The other people were too grumpy for hide-and-seek. And so we had to keep track of where we were and just hide in those places. We would have six, eight, sometimes ten kids hiding and seeking. One seeking, the rest hiding for those of you who didn't raise your hand and have never in your whole stinking life played hide and seek. <laughs> Not truth-telling folk. We would get ready. We would do our count. We always counted to 50. If you couldn't get yourself hidden by the time 50 was come, had come, too bad for you. And the last thing you say when you finish your count, remember what it is? Ready or not, here I come. Kids would climb trees. Some of our neighbors had cacti. I'm talking multiple cacti. Some kids tried to hide in there. Only one kid ever did it one time. This ready or not idea, ready or not, that's the scary part, isn't it? Ready, good, Jesus is coming. Not, whoo. Biblical descriptions of what happens if you're not are not good. That's why people fear this. That's why it brings some trepidation to some. That's why the call of the church has always been tell people about the good news of Jesus. You know what the good news of Jesus is, right? He died so you don't have to. He made the way where there was no way for a person like you or a person like me to get to heaven. He built the bridge over the chasm that we could not cross on our own. That's the good news. And that is still the good news. It was the good news from the beginning. It's the good news now. Even the sanctuary system where they're slaughtering all those lambs and all that stuff, all that business, all that blood and guts, all of that messy stuff we're glad we don't have to deal with today. 
was about a substitutionary sacrifice that would eventually be God himself. When Abraham made his covenant with God, and he cut in half all those animals, this is if you're not familiar with it, Genesis 15. If you go and you check it out, you should remember that the one who seals and signs the covenant of blood is not Abraham. It's God. And as a smoking pot appears in the night and passes between all of those animals, signing a contract, signing a covenant, this would have been something Abraham knew about. This was not, this looks to us really weird and really scary and just strange. But to Abraham, this was a suzerainty covenant, and he understood it. And when God passed through, God made a promise. And these were the words that the person passing through the animals would recite loudly so both armies, the one who won and the one who lost, could hear the losing king shout, Let it be done to me as was done to these animals if I should ever break this covenant. And instead of Abraham, who should have been the one passing through, God moved through those animals. And God said to Abraham, and through Abraham to everyone who would ever choose to believe in the sacrifice made for them, let it be done to me. And so it was. That's the amazing news that Christianity and Judaism before brought to the world. And that's the hope of anyone who's looking toward the second coming. Would you join me for one more prayer? As we begin this time of opening your word, walking through passages about your return, I pray for your blessing upon all of us. I especially ask for your spirit in the preacher and in the house tonight, today. Amen. Second coming. Lessons from Christmas, the first coming. We have a lot of these questions that pop up about the second coming. Why isn't it comes now? When is it going to come? Why didn't it come at this point? Why didn't it come at that point? We have all of this business going on in the church, in the world. Some people say Christianity isn't true because Jesus hasn't been here yet. Well, let's hold your horses a minute and remember the first coming of Jesus. That is now a historical event, right? It is now historically true that Jesus showed up the first time. But up until then, from the beginning of the first sin, until that Christmas, it was a prophetic future thing. We stand, after the resurrection of Jesus, waiting for a prophetic future event, right? Okay. So let's see what we can learn about this. Adam and Eve have Cain. Remember Cain and Abel? Some people believe that Cain and Abel were twins. Pastor Tim, I think, mentioned that when he was preaching a few weeks back. But when she asked Cain, Eve makes a comment. It's Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Adam Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man, and this Bible has a word inserted. If you have a, a, a King James, New King James, they tend to, when they insert a word for clarity, they will make it italicized. You see that from is tilted? Tell me you can see that on the screen. From is yellow, and it's tilted. That means that it is inserted for clarification. I have received... I have acquired a man from the Lord. Okay? 
It's an inserted word the Hebrew doesn't have, but could be implied from the Hebrew. You got it? When you translate, people do this all the time. Your Bible is trying to tell you, hey, we inserted a word here for clarification. That's why you'll see the italicized words in your Bible. Okay? Your Bible is trying to be as honest as it can with an English translation of a Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew text. Okay? From the Lord. Pastor Tim also mentioned this a couple weeks ago, stealing my thunder, Timothy. Without the addition of that word, this is what it says. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man, the Lord. After the fall, Adam and Eve were promised that there would be a redeemer who would crush the head of the serpent, right? And whose heel would be bit. And it, they were promised that this redeemer would come from their seed. Well, first seed, folk. This is firstborn child. The Hebrew can go either way. But it appears to me that Adam and Eve had hope that this was the Messiah. There were thousands of years from the birth of Cain to Bethlehem. And if you thought Cain was the Messiah and then he killed his brother, how'd that day go? I thought God was going to end all the sin mess we got ourselves into with you, and now you've killed your brother, and do you think maybe, just maybe, the 900 years that these two people lived on the earth weren't happy every day? Do you think that perhaps during those years they wished and hoped and expected the Messiah to arrive at any moment? Probably. Have you ever expected that the Messiah would come soon? Any of you that are old enough to have lived in the 60s? And you, uh, I know, how, I know I've, I've cut down to a handful of you, but I want to talk to you about this. When things were just a mess, a president was killed, his brother was killed, civil rights leader was killed, we were shooting rockets out into space, there were riots in the streets all over the country, the world was at war in several places at one time, the Russians were threatening to shoot rockets, we could die, all of us were hiding under our desks as if a nuclear weapon wouldn't kill us under our desk. All of that was going on in the 60s, and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people said, Jesus has to be coming soon, right? If you're old enough to, be in, to have been around in the 60s, you're aware that that didn't happen. We've come through cycle after cycle after cycle. About three of them as I'm keeping track of Jesus must be coming at any moment. Here's my question. Where is he? Thousands of years between there and Bethlehem. What about Noah and the flood? Why not then? Seems like things got pretty rough at that point. The Bible said that the Lord saw how evil humans had become on the earth. All day long, their deepest thoughts were nothing but evil. Seems like a good time to come and put a stop to the mess. Did he? Eh, kinda. Not what they were hoping for. Kinda. Every generation says, Lord, isn't it bad enough now? They were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And generation after generation after generation said, come on, man, show up. Show up. Aren't things bad enough? Think of all of those things. And Jesus shows up during the Roman Empire. Didn't come at the flood. Didn't come at Babylon. Didn't come at the, at the, uh, the time when Israel was, ex was excommunicated and sent to Babylon from the Promised Land. He waits until the Romans comes 
during the Roman Empire, thousands of years after the fall, comes during the Roman Empire. What do you think God was waiting for? Those of you historians, what do you think he was waiting for? Why the Roman Empire? Well, what do you know about the Roman Empire? They were big road builders. Big road builders. They built roads that we still use. There are roads in Europe that are built on top of the Roman foundations. That's how good the Roman roads were. They had something known as the Pax Romana. It's the peace of Rome. Now, the peace of Rome was maintained at the edge of a sword, but it was still there. You didn't have a great number of bandits rolling, roaming over the place because if you were found to be a bandit, the Romans would kill you. So that kind of cut down on the bandit gig. And so roads were relatively safe. The Romans allowed most of their citizens to maintain their faith. They would later persecute Christianity because it was a threat. But in general, they allowed people of different faiths to just go on about their business. It's kind of a unique moment in history. And I think this may be the reason Jesus showed up. I think maybe, perhaps, God was waiting for the ability to spread the gospel and to start what we know as the Western world. None of us could have imagined what God could see. That the, with the starting of the Western world, combining of religious freedom and monotheism and a political freedom of us type, you could spread the gospel around the world. The Western world has done more to spread the gospel to the rest of the world than has ever been done by anyone else. Perhaps Jesus was coming during the Roman Empire because that was when the world was finally ready for Jesus to come. Perhaps? Reasonable? Could you at least shrug for that? We know one thing for certain. God is not working on our timetable. I told my, the, the first look class today that I did not expect to graduate from college. I expected that Jesus was come before I graduated. Starting school, ready to go, I'll do this thing, God, but I, uh, I'm probably not going to finish. And here I am, a few years after college. And he hasn't come. He is not on my timetable. Can we agree on that much? Can everybody agree that God isn't operating on our timetable? Is it true that God knows most all the time is out of our timetable? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You ask for your prayers to happen when you want them to happen, and God makes your prayers happen when he's ready for them to happen because he knows when you're actually ready for them to happen, right? Anybody prayed for that right woman or right man? That you didn't end up marrying? Anybody really glad that didn't happen? Thank you, God, for your no. Right? But you can't know that the no is the best answer in the moment that you're asking. You can only trust that God knows better than you. Right? Man, you didn't know I was going to get in your business talking about the second coming. Psalm 90, verse 4. To you, God, a thousand years is like yesterday. I like this translation a lot. A thousand years is like yesterday. Like a few hours that are passed in the night. Time does not affect God like it affects you and me. God is looking at a much bigger map with a much greater plan than any of us can imagine. Is that fair? Yeah. Is it a fair statement? Yeah. People in the corner over here who never respond. Is it a fair statement? You know, those people in that corner over there, they respond. 
you guys kind of go over here to hide. I don't know if it's because the piano's over here or something keeps you guys feeling like, oh, we're good over here. You can't come talk to us. I'll be back. It doesn't matter how much we think we have control over what God is doing. We don't. We are invited into a relationship with God where we can speak to him like a child. And we're not talking about a 17-year-old. Maybe a 7-year-old speaks to his parent. It's mom, dad, why don't you do this? Could you do that? When your 7-year-old gives you advice... Do you jump up and do that? Why wouldn't you follow the rules of a seven? Why not give your seven-year-old charge of your household and your credit card? Why not? Because they do not have the skill set necessary to do that. You're a seven-year-old. God is God. Okay? You have this much brain. And my hands are big. I'm granting some of you some extra. (laughs) You have this much brain. And you're trying to understand the workings of the eternal God. Can we maybe admit? We don't actually know. We can't even imagine what God has planned. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. So go back a thousand years from today. Think in your mind. What what was going on a thousand years ago? So what year is it, folks? 2024. So go back to 1024. Was life a little different? I was thinking while I was in Michigan and it was freezing cold outside how glad I was for simple things like heat and glass. You know that glass was not a regular thing in people's houses until the last 100 years or so. And then primarily in the West, it's still not a big thing in a lot of places. Do you know what glass does? It allows you to close the hole without becoming a part of a cave community. Prior to this glass thing becoming cool for us, it was cold in the house anyway, and you only had a big block of wood over your window. Standing there between double sealed glass and another seal on the outside because it's Michigan and it's cold and they want all the protection they can get, looking out at six degrees and going, Man, I'm glad I'm not out there. And I am so thankful for this glass and central heat. A thousand years is like a day to God. A thousand twenty-four to twenty twenty-four passed, and it just passed. Don't take this to mean that God doesn't care, but take it to understand that time does not affect him the way it affects us, okay? We don't know when Jesus is coming. We just don't. Is that a fair statement? I'm asking you this a lot because we have a lot of opinions and we say a lot of things about this, but we need to kind of get tracking with what is actually true. If God is not on our timetable and it is really true that we don't know when Jesus is coming. There's lots and lots and lots of prophecies and stuff. But most of those prophecies are not super clear. They're clearish, right? They say some things that might be. Remember, Jesus was going to be from the tribe of Judah, right? Why Judah after the Tamar thing? Don't know, but Judah. Grace. He was going to be of the seed of David. Could you imagine when David's first kid is born and the prophecy comes out that this this Messiah is going to come from your seed? David's like looking at his kids going, that one? That one? That one? I got a lot of seeds, God. Which 
Which one? God tells him it will come from the line of Solomon. This kid from his mistake. Why that? You got Judah and Tamar, now you got Solomon and David and Bathsheba and all that. Clearly the seed that comes is telling us something about the grace of the gospel. And when the last son of Solomon died, everybody went, oh, man. While he was alive, we still had a chance. We were sure that it would be this generation we would see the Messiah. Can you imagine? I mean, there were people in the first century who listened to a word of Jesus who said, when Jesus said, this generation will not pass until I come. And everybody went back to the generation right there and said, okay, disciples, 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 John is dying. Who got asked? John dies and the last person dies. And they go, Whoa, wait a minute. We thought Jesus said this and meant that and do you understand you're not the first people to be a little disappointed in the process? I hate not knowing stuff. We do know that his coming is literal. Is that fair? Because there are people who say, well, no, 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 no. Even in the first century, his coming is not literal. It's just like when the Spirit came into you. That's Jesus' second coming. Yeah, it's not the way the Bible seems to be describing it. It is little, literal. And in 1 Thessalonians 3, which we read today, Paul writes, For this we say to you by the word of the who? Lord Jesus. He's saying, we're not telling you something we think. We're telling you what Jesus said about himself. Okay? All right. It is literal. It is personal. And it is loud. Here's what Paul wrote. For the Lord himself, personal, personal, front row, two people, will descend from heaven with a shout, loud, with the voice of the archangel. Maybe there are two shouts. And the trumpet of God. i got to believe that the trumpet of God has some power behind. It sounds like it's literally Jesus, and it's really loud. You got that? Does that make sense? Is that fair? Okay, good. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and will be caught up together with them in the clouds. It's not only loud and literal, it's wild. You imagine you've gone to the graveyard for the burying of your sainted Mary, or Aunt Mary. And you're standing there. When Jesus appears. And Aunt Mary opens her eyes and comes up through the casket. I don't know how Jesus gets people out of things. But I'm, I'm thinking like, whoop, like Jesus would go through doors and think something like that. He rearranges her molecules. She comes through and boom, there she is. Looking like she did when she was 22. I picked 22 because I liked 22. <laughs> and it's my wife's favorite number. Can you imagine what it would be like to be standing there in the funeral and all around you, graves start popping open and people start popping out, not like the night of the living dead, but like, boom, Adam and Eve. All around you, we who are alive and remain. Whoo, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain. Who gets to rise first? The dead in Christ. So who's not rising yet? Those who are alive and remain. So if you see a cloud about the size of a man's hand appearing out in the, in, the, in the sky and it starts to grow and you realize it's angels, run, do not walk to the next cemetery, do not pass, go, do not collect $200, get there because it's going to be a show. <laughs> Look around before you go because it's going to be wild. Does that like sound like fun to you? 
you people are boring. <laughs> this just sounds like a hoot to me. Run to the graveyard and watch because it's going to be amazing. People coming out looking like Adam and Eve, looking freshly minted from the hand of God, not like anybody you've ever seen, not broken, not sad, not harmed, not wrinkly, maybe bald, maybe not bald. Maybe bald is what you're supposed to be. You don't know. Maybe hair was the mark on Cain. Ever give that a thought, fellas? But they're going to come out looking perfect. And then you, according to 1 Corinthians 15, you get all perfect up yourself. This messed up body of yours gets transformed. And how does that work? Do you just stand there and suddenly, poof, 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 you look amazing? And heaven forbid. You know what the problem with that is? No mirrors. Because you've run to the graveyard. No mirrors in graveyards. You'd be looking at your hands. And people would be looking at you like, whoa. And you'd be looking at them like, whoa. And you don't know why you're whoa. But it will be cool. And it will be wild. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, it's going to be permanent. This is not, ooh, I almost said a name. Your favorite actor's latest facelift. No. You know, they got their faces stuck in a smile because they pulled their face back so hard their ears have moved forward. Then we who are alive and remain will rise up to meet the Lord in the air, and then the sentence that matters. And thus, we shall always be. Now stop there for a second. No more broken. No more shattered. No more death. No more sorrow. No more pain. All of it's gone. Gone. Permanently gone. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. The second coming is not the end of time. It's the beginning of a new life as God intended us to be. Amen. It's the return to the Edenic nature that we were designed for. No more fighting with each other. You won't even want to argue with your wife. She won't even want to argue with you because you have Jesus' heart now. You're no longer broken. You no longer have a heart of stone. You've been given a transformed life, nature, heart, body. You have been given a change that is available to you because Jesus died to make it possible. It's permanent. It's a forever thing. Last. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The one flaw with my plan about the cemetery, I think we're all going to be distracted by Jesus. Though the cemetery thing would be fun. But I think seeing Jesus come might get our attention. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, they're going to see me come. I spent a lot of time worrying about this when I was young. Is he going to like zip around the world so fast everybody sees him at one time? One of my friends that I've known, I've had, I've known since I was 13 years old. 
very big brain, lots of physics. We were talking about the fact that gravity can bend light. And I realized that it would not be outside the normal activities of the laws of physics for God to just turn up the bend a little. And wherever he showed up, we all saw him. It's good because the Bible says we're all going to. And he will send out his angels, Jesus speaking. The Son of Man will send out his angels. Jesus is talking about himself. Sort of like Ricky Henderson used to. Ricky would always talk about what Ricky was going to do. This is the Son of Man talking about what the Son of Man is going to do. Jesus speaking of himself in the third person. He will send out his angels with mighty blast of a trumpet. Loud again. And they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world. You know how you get to be a chosen one? Choose Jesus. It's the craziest thing. You choose being chosen. It's awesome. Best gig you ever got offered. The Lord isn't slow. to do what he's promised, as some people think. When Peter writes about the end of time and the destruction of the world, I mean, he gets serious about it. He talks about the elements melting. But he adds this. I know people have been waiting, and I know people are sick of waiting, and I know there are sick people waiting, and I know that they might not make it, and they might end up having a nap before they get up and they see Jesus. I know Peter, who would shortly after this be hung on a cross upside down and die. Paul, who may have been in the same jails with Peter, at the same This is not a good time to lose the mic, so I'm going to get another one. I could be heard in here, but this is too important. Devil, messing around with me. The Lord isn't slow to do what he promised, as some people think of slowness. I'm turning this other one off. This is still working. As some people think. Rather, he is patient. Why is it taking so long, God? Patience. Why are you not here now? Patience. Why haven't you ended this before the mess that's happened this week? Patience. Immensely indulgent patience. You know how you would like God to hold the door open to your family got in? Everybody's his family. Rather, he is patient for your sake. He doesn't want to destroy anyone. The next time you hear somebody say, God is just going to kill everybody because he doesn't like people because he's mean, he's angry, and he's cranky if he's even real. Those people don't understand that it was God who died on the cross so that we would have the opportunity to get there. Peter, one of some of his last written words, he's patient. He doesn't want to destroy anyone. He's waiting for everybody. He wants all people to have the opportunity to turn to him in repentance. The second coming is a massive act of redemption and restoration. It is not God getting even. Good grief. If you want him to get even, you just light the place up. Send it out of its orbit and let it crash into the sun. He's God, after all. He made this little blue dot. 
he is carefully and kindly, patiently waiting for the last heart who's willing to say yes. And then he comes. This is a God, our God, who is patiently waiting for the last yes. And we get to wait with him. Because you know what this means, right? There are people still, wait, still out there who will say yes. Any moment that Jesus has not appeared is a proof that there are still people who will say yes. And last thing. I've said this to you in this church before, and I will say it every chance I get. God is not trying to keep you out of heaven. God is not trying to keep you out of heaven. He's not raising the bar every time you reach the level you think you need to be reaching. He is not trying to keep you out of heaven. He is desperately trying to get you in. Desperately. Desperate enough to lay down his life to make it possible. To be the substitute who paid the wages of sin so that we don't have to. I have two things to say. Number one, if you have not yet gotten this ticket, get this ticket. Choose Jesus. He's just waiting for you. He is waiting for you to choose him so that he can give you the assurance that you're going home. No matter how long it takes, if you end up in the dirt pushing up daisies, the Bible says you're not going to know what time it is. The next thing you'll see is Jesus. Don't worry about it. If you happen to be here sprinting for the cemetery when you see the cloud coming, good for you. It's going to be wild. But he's trying to get you in. He's just waiting for you to say yes. If you already know this, tell somebody. Let people know that the mess we find ourselves is, it's not the end. No matter how big of a mess we make or how big of a mess we discover, it's not the end. God's plan is to wipe, out, wipe away all tears from our eyes. To take away sin, sorrow, pain, death, and cast them away, never to be seen again. And to grant you the kind of life that he built the planet for. That he built the Garden of Eden for. Where you live without worry of death. Where you live without a heart that is angry and selfish. Instead, you just naturally care about those around you. Let's pray. Father God, Thank you for this crazy plan. Thank you for not just putting your thumb on Adam and Eve and ending it. Or just changing the plan and saying, oh no, we don't want to do that. Thank you for being willing. Thank you for being willing to have your children come home. Thank you for being for us. Thank you for waiting. In Jesus' name.